Whole life insurance and taxes. The subject of taxes is always a popular topic. Whole life insurance is a vehicle that has been used for a long time, well north of 100 years, and we often hear of banks, big corporations, and the ultra wealthy utilizing whole life insurance, often specifically for the cash value, which we're gonna get into the benefits and when taxes can and cannot occur with these products. But this is something that has been used forever. And because of it, cash value life insurance is often marketed as a tax-free savings vehicle. Who doesn't want something tax-free? I do. The thing is, with any product, I want to understand the pros and the cons. How do I use the product and set it up where it's tax-free? Oh, but by the way, is there a situation in which I can end up paying taxes? Because there is on my cash value. So let's get into it. If we look at the core benefits of a cash value life insurance policy. So a whole life insurance policy, someone who is interested in the cash value as an immediate short-term and long-term asset on their balance sheet. Here we go. It is a safe, meaning my money is not invested in or linked to the stock market at all. Safe area to position money. Liquid, meaning I can access that money anytime I want through a withdrawal or through a loan. And then also tax-free. Tax-free if I don't mess it up. And I al always like to emphasize that word if because yes, one can utilize a cash value life insurance product as a tax-free savings vehicle. But there are situations in which I can run into a taxable event. And this is what happens. Buyer's remorse can pop up. Happened a lot with universal life policies that were issued back in the 80s. After the fact, they blew up and these big tax bombs occurred for policyholders. You don't see it that much with whole life and it's easy to avoid. The thing is awareness, transparency. We have to be aware and or our agent must be aware of setting that product up properly. This way, when I execute the strategy, I'm good. Like if I hire a, an attorney, a consultant, a, uh, someone for business, whatever it might be, like I want a professional that shows me they know what they're doing. Yes, tell me the details if I wanna know it, but at the same time, it's like, okay, you know your stuff, you are a true expert in your field, here's everything I got, here's what I wanna accomplish, and then they craft the plan for that. There's an attorney, a group we're working right with right now, and they are fantastic. That's why that's fresh on my mind. So as we continue through this, I don't wanna get off track. <laughs> We're going to specifically talk about the cash value. Let's talk about the death benefit first in taxes, actually, because this is a life insurance policy. With a whole life insurance policy or any life insurance policy, the death benefit proceeds are paid out 100% income tax-free, meaning your beneficiaries do not receive or do not have to report any income tax. So if my uh, beneficiaries, let's say it's the next generation, earn $100,000 per year, that's their taxable income, and they receive a $1 million death benefit, that death benefit is not added to their taxable income for that year. Death benefit proceeds are paid income tax-free. They are not automatically exempt from estate taxes. If I have a large estate, a very high net worth, and I just have an individual beneficiary, unless it is my spouse, there's no taxation there, but if it goes to anyone else, the second generation, there's going to be taxes. Typically in those situations, special types of trusts are established in order to have those death benefit proceeds paid out completely tax-free as well. But that's a good conversation to have with an attorney or someone else along with your insurance professional or financial professional. Now let's get into the fun part. Let's get into the cash value here. So. The cash value and taxation. We're gonna go through some bullet points here just to create transparency. I've got payments, growth on my money, accessing my money, and then MEC, MEC, which stands for Modified Endowment Contract. And as we go through this, keep in mind the core benefits. Cash value life insurance is safe. In 2008, people continue to see their money appreciate. I do not have to worry about losing money. In fact, on that safety piece, here is what you can realistically expect. The actual internal rate of return, the net performance on cash value over time. Not the dividend, 
not to, aside from what the illustrations project, when we look at real data policies that have lived the test of time, we have a lot of policies in the books that have done better than that. In policies from a long time ago that individuals have been kind enough to share with us and some insurance companies that have done much better than that, but we're in a low interest rate environment, maybe that might be the case for a little bit, so we're gonna shoot it conservative. If it does better than that, hey, we all love each other. But if it does worse than what I say, we're not happy with each other. So safe, liquid, tax-free, cash value in respect to the payments. Okay, so in respect to taxes, if I am paying money into a life insurance policy, let's say I am contributing $100,000 per year. That is my net payment into the policy. We design it, perhaps I have a $10,000 base premium, small term rider, the rest is going into PUAs to accelerate the cash value, whatever it might be. $100,000 per year going into the product, what are the tax implications, if any, on that payment? Well, payments are made with after-tax dollars meaning I cannot deduct those payments like I could with a 401k or some type of qualified account. So any contributions I make or payments are made with after-tax dollars. Now the question comes up sometimes here, is there any way to deduct payments on a life insurance policy? And the answer is, if I want an individually owned policy, typically no. Technically, there are ways you can deduct payments on a life insurance policy. One thing you could do is own a life insurance policy inside of a qualified plan or have a qualified plan own it. An example could be a self-directed IRA or 401k, could be a 412 or 419 plan, and there's other plans out there as well, which we can deduct payments into the plan and then have life insurance elected within the plan. Not very many people we work with do this. In fact, none really do at the end of the day. Some are interested in, about, interested in it, interested in it. It is a good option to see sometimes, but a huge benefit which we're going to get into with cash value life insurance is the liquidity. Qualified plans are typically not liquid and that defeats the purpose in a sense. I'm taking that upfront tax deduction. Maybe I like just the safety, the three and a half to five and a half percent growth. There's a death benefit as well, but if it's in a qualified plan, it's in a qualified plan. We've talked to a lot of people, you may have felt this way as well in the past. Hey, a 401k is a great way to accumulate wealth over time, grow my money, but I gotta wait until I'm 59 and a half to touch it. And when I do touch it, I've gotta pay full income tax on all of it because I've deferred it, I've deducted it up front. So that is one way you could technically deduct payments, but again, not many people who we work with do it. However, it is an option that we can certainly look at if anyone would like to. So after tax dollars is how we make payments into a life insurance policy. So after tax dollars, meaning if I made $100,000 this year and paid income tax on it already, whether it was taken out of each paycheck or if I just write a check to the IRS April of each year or whenever it is, at that point in time, I've paid my income tax. So whatever money I have left over, when I state payments are made with after-tax dollars, money I already paid taxes on. Growth, let's progress on here. So with growth, the money technically grows tax deferred. That is the treatment of a cash value life insurance policy. So if I have $100,000 in a policy and it is growing, I see dividends and the guaranteed rate credited to that product, it's growing, I've got more money than what I've paid in. Tax deferred means it is growing and I do not have to pay taxes on it while it is appreciating. Now, on that point, you might say, okay, well, how do I get it tax-free? Because that's the big benefit, and it is. But technically, the IRS treatment, how it classifies it, is our money in a cash value life insurance policy grows tax-deferred because there are ways I can run into tax issues here. So 
Now it's a short and sweet point. Accessing the money. This one we're going to spend some more time on. So when it comes to accessing your money in a cash value life insurance policy, two ways I can pull money out. One, I can take a withdraw. Or two, I can take a policy loan. And if I do not have a modified endowment contract, so we're assuming that our policy is still a traditional life insurance policy. It is classified as life insurance by the IRS, non-MEC. When will taxes occur with either these areas? Well, with a policy withdrawal, I can typically withdraw up to my cost basis. That's how much I can withdraw or, or pull out. So my cost basis is the total dollar amount I've paid into the product. So for example, if your total payments were $100,000 and you have a value of $300,000, talking about accessing the money, my cost basis would be $100,000. I can take policy withdrawals up to $100,000. Anything I withdraw above and beyond that $100,000 is subject to ordinary income tax. So if the transaction I use to pull money exceeds my cost basis, in this example of $100,000, I would have to deal with ordinary income tax on the gains. Very important to be aware of that. However, policy loans are not taxable. So often a strategy that is presently used to sell retirement strategies with cash value life insurance is, hey, we can first withdraw up to our cost basis because that does not incur any loan interest and then begin to loan out the rest. It can be a very effective strategy. A lot of corporations will do this when we look at their uh, SERP structure, which is a supplemental executive retirement plan, involves taking policies out typically on key members, retaining them, and then when those benefits are eventually paid to those executives once they retire, this is typically the strategy that is used. When you look at the guarantees, this will typically benefit the um, income situation the most as well. But I can withdraw up to my cost basis with no tax. Okay. That's in retirement. Another, another side note I want to add with taking policy withdrawals is if we take a withdrawal in the first seven years of a life insurance policy, I do want to be mindful of this because that will trigger what is called a material change because when I take a policy withdrawal, the death benefit will be reduced, which means the MEC limit will be reduced. We're going to touch on the MEC, the MEC limit next as well. But if I take a policy withdrawal, in the first seven years, what will happen? My death benefit will be reduced, which means in turn my MEC limit will be reduced. And where this can be an issue is if I have a $100,000 MEC limit and I've paid in $100,000 in the first year, and then year two, I decide to take a policy withdraw, what's going to happen? Well, I funded up to that MEC limit in year one, so when I take that withdraw, the, MEC, the death benefit drops, MEC limit now drops below $100,000, and I have to deal with a modified endowment contract. We had that happen once. Fortunately, the company that we work with is always 100% of cases on the ball, notified us right away, we reversed the transaction and classified it as a loan instead. So. It's typically very easy to fix a mech if you catch it within the first 30 to 60 days. Okay, but definitely something good to be aware of there. Loans are not taxable. So I could take a loan in the first year if I wanted to, and it's not taxable. Does it make sense? Not all the time, but again, that depends on my personal situation, meaning from a policy performance standpoint. Now, as we continue on, accessing money. If I have a total cash value of $300,000 in a policy and I say, I'm done with this life insurance policy, I want out. How do I get out of the thing? <laughs> and we're told, okay, can I just cash it out? 
Well, if I cash the policy out, that would be called a cash out or a surrender. What would happen in this case is it would be viewed as a pure withdrawal of $300,000. So I've paid in 100K, took out a total of 300,000. That is a $200,000 gain, which results in $200,000 in income tax that I have to deal with as a consumer now. Who wants to deal with that? No, no one does. So I cannot cash out. How about some alternatives? This is the kind of stuff I used to think through when I was new in the industry. Are, are there any workarounds here? <laughs> and there's really not. So can I do this? Can I say, okay, whatever my age is now, I wanna take that 300K out and I want it to remain tax-free all the way through because I don't like the policy anymore. Let's say that that happens. I want to withdraw 100K and then immediately after that, I'm going to loan out 200K for a total of 300. So I'm going to use the rules that the life insurance company allows in order to get my money out tax-free. I'm going to withdraw up to my cost basis and then loan out the rest. Well, what happens is if we loan out every penny in the policy and I've got a zero balance or 95%, what will happen is that policy will then most likely lapse. If it lapses, what happens is the exact same thing that would happen if I had just cashed it out in the first place. The IRS is going to look at, okay, you paid in $100,000, you pulled out a total of $300,000, that's two hundred dollars more than what you paid in, so you've got that $200,000 taxable gain, ordinary income tax we have to deal with. So if a policy lapses, we do have to deal with income tax too on any of the gains, the money that we've pulled out. And if there's a loan balance on that, that could result in significantly greater income tax for the consumer. We've got other videos on that. Again, you don't see that a whole lot with a whole life insurance. It's more likely to happen if it does happen with universal life type products, just how those work. So when it comes to accessing the money, I can access money through a withdrawal or a loan. First seven years, I want to be careful of taking out withdrawals because I could trigger a MEC depending on how much I've paid in, material change and such that will occur. But loans, I can take any time. And I do not have to worry about taxes unless I loan out everything and I'm not paying premiums, not paying any loan interest. I've just drained the policy, which I don't really want to do, but that could get me into an issue there. So on accessing the money, very easy to keep it tax-free. If I'm utilizing it to pay off debt, invest in real estate, take advantage of opportunities, that's where those policy loans are very effective. If I'm using it for retirement income, that's where, where withdrawals come into play and can be used very effective, in my opinion, as well. Let's continue on here. Touched on accessing the money. Now let's touch on the mech. So what are the core benefits to a cash value life insurance product? Safe, liquid, tax-free. Any life insurance policy can become classified as this MEC, stands for Modified Endowment Contract. If this happens, I lose a lot of the tax benefits that come with a cash value policy. So when we hear, hey, we can use it tax-free, this happens, not gonna be the case at all. Here's specifically how it works. And every policy has what is called a MEC limit. I would refer you to one of our policy design videos just to really learn how to set the MEC limit wherever you'd like. So if a policy becomes classified as a MEC, what happens is the growth on cash value is still tax deferred. So as it grows, I do not have to deal with any taxation at all. The death benefit on a modified endowment contract is still paid out 100% in 
income tax-free. So if I am utilizing a MEC for estate tax planning or just leaving a large death benefit, maybe I'm attracted to a single premium policy, MECs sometimes have a place. Depends on one situation. But death benefit proceeds are still paid out income tax-free with a modified endowment contract. It's specifically the cash value that's impacted. So we talked about the growth on cash value still being tax deferred. Here's what happens. If I am going to access money on a modified endowment contract, and this applies to both a withdrawal and a loan, doesn't matter how I pull the money out, in respect to the gains only, because I've still funded it with after-tax dollars, two things happen. One, I have to pay income tax on them. And two, I have to deal with a 59 and a half age rule, <laughs> that 59 and a half age, age 59 and a half penalty. Meaning if I touch the money prior to age 59 and a half, I have to deal with another 10% penalty tax. It's ugly, I don't want it, get rid of it, no thanks. Now, one other thing to touch on with a modified endowment contract is if we go back to that example we had of a cost basis of 100K and cash value oops, of 300K, what would happen in this case? Well, if I withdraw, let's say I have a mech and I think, okay, can I just withdraw up to my cost basis and I don't have to worry about it? We're taxed on the gains first with a modified endowment contract. With a non-MEC, that's not the case. I can withdraw my principal balance first. But here, can't do it. So if I'm under the age of 59 and a half, or even if I'm not, if I have $300,000 in cash value and I decide to pull out $100,000, my cost basis was $100,000. But I'm going to pay income tax on the gains first, in this case, the first $200,000. So MECs cripple really the cash benefit, I'm sorry, the tax benefits on cash value life insurance in many ways. So it's good to be familiar or aware of how a modified endowment contract works. This way, if I'm ever considering it, this way I can avoid it. But the more important thing, in my opinion, oops, is the MEC limit. And without getting into detail here, because we do this in other videos, no one wants a MEC. Just about everyone that we work with does not want this to occur because who doesn't want access to their money? I do. That way I can take advantage of opportunities and such that come up. But with a MEC limit, we can set that wherever we want. If we're working with someone and it's appropriate for them to put in $10,000 per year, that's what they want, or they're transferring assets, maybe it's $200,000 per year, a million bucks, whatever it might be, and they say, the death benefit's important, but cash value is my priority, what we will do is design the policy to have the lowest death benefit possible based off of the appropriate MEC limit they need. So if I want the ability to pay in $150,000 per year, I'm going to set my MEC limit at, guess what? $150,000 per year or a little bit higher if I want to be able to pay into the product for a long period of time. A lot of information here, and really that's the purpose of this video, just to throw more info out there and some examples on tax situations. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit more detail on the next video, just with some actual numbers. So we're gonna look at policies, how they work, and then with those policies, if hypothetical events occur with payments, growth, accessing money, modified endowment contract, when specifically would taxes occur? This way I've got more awareness and know, hey, if I'm an agent, I can set things up right for my client. And if I'm a consumer, well, ho hopefully my agent went over this, or if we did, hopefully we did, we're doing it now, went over it with you. But we have a good understanding on the product and how it works. Had fun with this one, hope you did too. If you have any questions, reach out. And as always, I hope this helps. Hey guys, Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.